push this to record. And I'll set the digital recorder in your direction. Okay. And then I'm going to turn the backup on here. I'll turn the microphone on. Okay. Get that in there. Power. Record. Play. Lights on. Yeah. This uh, Veterans History Project interview is being conducted today on Wednesday, August the 8th in the year 2007 uh, at the Niles Public Library in the group study room. My name is Neil O'Shea. I'm a member of the staff here at the Niles Library and I have the privilege of sitting across the table from Mr. Robert John Morris who was born in 1932 and served in the U.S. Army during the Korean War. And we appreciate Mr. Morris coming in today okay. uh, to share his uh, memoir of uh, service to his country uh, with us. So Mr. Morris, how did you uh, come to be in the U.S. Army? Well, my... Uh People that were born in the same year I was, or in, in my era, when you became 18 years old, you wanted to register for the draft, knowing that somewhere around the age of 20 you would be drafted. That's how I got in the army. I got drafted. So you were drafted? Yes. Um, did some of your friends make make a decision to enlist? Or? Oh, yeah. No, I had guys in the Coast Guard and then the Air Force and the Marines and... Navy, and they all thought they could get out of combat by doing that. They had to serve more time than being drafted, but that's what... And did, that's that, what, did that strategy work for them? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Most of the guys, with the, except for the Marine Corps, most of the guys that I knew that they did enlist served, if they did serve in Korea, they weren't on the front lines or that sort of thing. Had people in your family served in the in the military? Well, my father was a reserve. My father was a army uh, uh, lifer. He went in the army at the beginning of World War II and stayed in 20, 25 years. I've forgotten now, but he went in as an officer. Did Did the army ever beckon to you as a career? No, no, not at all. <laughs> I know. Not at all. I just wanted to serve by two, and I realized that was my obligation, and uh, I wanted to get out. I had no desire to make it. So if you en if you uh, if you enlist, uh, join up voluntarily, mm -hmm. yeah. then your your uh, required duty time is uh, certain years active, it's certain years reserved. Well, you've got any your obligation any either way you cut it. Just that if, if the longer you serve on active duty, the shorter your Reserve time is. Uh, if you serve, I guess I served two years active duty and six years reserve time. Now, if I would have say taken enlisted for three years, I guess my reserve time would have been cut down by a year or maybe two. I really don't recall that much about it anymore. So you um, you were drafted then at the age of. 22. 20. 20, pardon me, 20. Did, did that disrupt your life? Or no. You still no, no, no. I guess I prepared for it. I just knew it was going to happen. And unless there was something I didn't know about physically that I would be going in, and that's what happened. So was your generation, uh, I guess you were, you were in 8th uh, grade or high school during the World War II years and yeah. the outbreak of Korea, were you all... Uh, was there a feeling of patriotism or? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Much more than probably the guys in Vietnam and, uh, yeah, I'd say, say so. You just expected that to happen and it was a way of life, you know. And so there were no surprises in the family? No, no, yeah, not, so. at all, not at all. So where did you, did you, where were you inducted? Uh, uh, Fort Sheard, Illinois. We went down there and we spent a week there and uh, being processed and then we were sent out to different locations in the, across the country. So your basic, basic training, training I went to California. Fort Ord or? No, Fort Lewis, Washington. Or, uh, I'm sorry, Camp Roberts, California. Camp Roberts. Yeah, they closed it right after the Korean War was over. 
And uh, was that a pleasant experience, basic training? Or? No. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was all right. I mean, if you look back on it, it was, you know, it was what it was. But you know, it wasn't anything that I wanted to go over again, or I'd recommend, you know, people want to go out and have fun. It was, uh, it was what it was. Yeah. And I'm sure it wasn't any more pleasant anyplace else. Just warmer. Yeah. Were there uh, did you meet interesting people in the basic training? Or from the I think in, you meet interesting people all through the military. I've met people that I never thought I'd ever even talk to, you know, and that I'd never have a chance to meet any other time. And it was really, it was, that part of it was very interesting. I really enjoyed it. And I've never kept in touch with anybody particularly. I always thought I would, but I didn't. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So did, did, did some of the the people you went through basic training with, including yourself, were you were you thinking about you might have to go to Korea? Or? Oh yeah, there was no doubt. In fact, um, out of my outfit, my basic training uh, class, for want of a better word, uh, three guys went to Europe, two guys went to Alaska, five guys stayed in the States, and everybody else went to Korea. And how many would that have been roughly that went to Korea then? Oh, uh, probably 220. Wow. Yeah, the rest of them. And, I, and I, the reason I stayed is because they lost my orders. I was uh, supposed to go to Korea. I was, that was what I was trained for. And uh, when it came time to shipping everybody out, there were five of us that sat back and they didn't have any orders for us. And they didn't know why. And it turned out that they lost my orders. And I was one of five guys. And so they kept me on as a holdover trainee in California, and I went through two training cycles as a two basic training cycles, right? As a cadreman, which is like a drill instructor in the Marine Corps, and I we would go out there and train troops. So that's what I did for a year after I got out. Did you enjoy training troops? Oh, sure, it was fun. We'd get up in the morning and take them out, and then sit under a tree and wait for the instructors to get done with them, and take them back, and then we'd be done for the day. And then the only reason I found out that is this, is this wasn't the best thing that ever happened to me because I wanted to go home. I'd been in the Army for a year and everybody else was going home on leave around me. And uh, it was my turn and I asked for a leave and they said, we can't give it to you because you're not assigned to anybody, you're holdover. And what does that mean? And they said, well, you're, you're never assigned to anybody. You can't be promoted, you can't uh, get a furlough, you can't do anything, you're just here. And uh, so I go, well, that's silly. I mean, you know, how, how do I change that? I mean, I, you know, obviously I want to make more money, which means promotion, and, and not that I want to make career. But every time you get promoted, you make more money. Not a lot, because they don't pay a lot. But anyway, so they finally put me in this permanent party. By this time, the Korean War was over. And they were closing the camp, so they signed me to a... Uh, uh, a security guard outfit that was attached to the MPs, and we did that until the camp closed, and they sent us all to Fort Lewis, Washington. And uh, then I got my curl, and I got promoted, all in the same breath. So when I got to my new uh, station, I was a PFC, which is a big deal, because they just they they had rank had been frozen all this time, and they they unfroze the ranks that people could get promoted. Anyway. Uh, I was due for sergeant the day I got out of the Army. And they asked me if I wanted to make sergeant. And I said, well, sure. And they said, okay, you're going to have to re-enlist. I said, no, I don't want to do it that bad. <laughs> so I just took my... Got so you're in this, this sort of limbo of yeah. official, of officialese. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and they decided to make use of you while you were in this... Right, well, they didn't want me to sit around and do nothing, God forbid. So they use you as sort of like a, a trainer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they had an extra pair of hands that they wouldn't have had otherwise, and so they took advantage of it. And it worked out good for me, except for getting promoted. That's all I really cared you about. You don't think they, they they just decided you might be good at this training, and they just decided to keep you on in some sort well, of way? Well, they knew the bubble was going to burst eventually anyway, because the war was almost over. And, you know, when it was ended, they just knew it would be a matter of time before this camp got closed. Mm -hmm. And then they had to do something with all these extra people. Mm -hmm. In fact, they had a lot of guys who, were, who wanted to make career soldiers, that ended up getting kicked, tossed out of the army. They just because they didn't have anything else to do with them. It was a peacetime, and they so they just said. So some of them, them, some of the some of the young men that you worked with, that you trained, mm -hmm. they went to Korea. Is that right? Well, the Korean War was over. Yeah, they they probably went, but there was no you know just a matter of uh, 
of uh, them being occupation troops, more or less. You know, they were there. You know, so they're still there. So is were you all um, pleased that the war ended then? Or were some people thinking, oh, I really wanted to get over there? Or, oh, I didn't know if anybody really wanted to go. Yeah. I mean, nobody really, you know, they... Unlike the, the guys in Nam that says, hell no, we won't go. We It never occurred to us to, to do that. Yeah. I mean, we just, we knew that if we did that, we'd probably end up in prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we didn't. So, um, did you gain weight, lose weight uh, uh, while you were in the... Uh, when I went in the Army, I just got out of high school about two years before, or a year before. I weighed 150 pounds, I'm six foot tall, I've been six foot tall since I was about 14. Which I was a skinny little rundown kid. I got, I had 14 or six, 16 weeks of basic training. When I got done with basic training, I went up to 185 pounds. And I didn't have an ounce of fat on me. I don't say it was buff, but I was in the best shape I've ever been in my life. And I stayed that way until I got out of the Army. But I was in the infantry, so they worked us all the time. I mean, it wasn't like hard work, but we kept, you know, a regiment of, you know, we had a certain time we had to go to bed. We had uh, a well-balanced diet. I ain't good as a civilian, but, you know, when you eat good, it means you're filling your belly. There they give you a well-balanced diet, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it did me a lot of it. <laughs> Your parents still recognize you, though, when you came home on your eventual uh, oh, yeah, yeah, leave yeah, or yeah. furlough. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The guy must have thought you were a good authority figure, or maybe, or uh, something, do you think? Well, I, I don't know. You know, they uh, if they would have had uh, uh, the machines they got today where they have your, you know, they can look up your personnel record in five seconds, they probably would have, because my father was an army officer, and he was in military intelligence. I would help me a lot, but in those days they didn't know. You know they, they had no way. I mean, they, if they knew it, but it would to look it up on a computer. They didn't have that kind of knowledge. Do you ever find yourself at a, an odd moment thinking about somebody back there in those times and chuckling about what a character they were? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure, all the time. Yeah, yeah. I remember a guy when I was at uh, Fort Lewis. A guy we call him Gizmo. Gizmo. Uh, and I don't remember his name anymore, but it was just, everybody called him Gizmo. And he was a black guy from the south side of Chicago. And he was probably a gangbanger. We just didn't know it at the time. Nice guy, but he always talked real tough. And he sounded like he had a whiskey voice. He had this real heavy, and he was always getting in trouble because he, he was always flaunting authority. Well, it turned out he wasn't drafted. He enlisted in the Army. And when we found out about it, we really gave his life a living hell because, you know, he... He enlisted and he was acting the way he was. It was like, you know, guys that were complaining because they got drafted. And I always wondered what happened to him. But he got tossed out of the Army. Not a bad discharge, but he was one of those guys that after the war was over, they didn't want him anymore. They needed him when they got him. If they, you know, in war, the Army was open to anybody. But after the war was over, they just they got rid of a lot of people. My father was one of them. He was in and out of the Army all the time. And he was an officer. And his uh, when he died, his uh, chaplain was a guy who had been in the uh, Army Reserve, and they let him go because they didn't need chaplains anymore. And he wanted to make a career of it. He was planning on doing it for the rest of his life, and then getting a, a, a small uh, pension. Yeah, you know, when, when he got out of well, he would have been he got a big pension because he was a colonel. But he would have taken that and then gone and got himself a little parish someplace and gone from there. Yeah. yeah. What high school did you attend, man? Sullivan. Sullivan. Tigers, right? Sullivan Tigers. Yeah, yeah. very good. How do you know that? Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of mm -hmm. Chicago in over the years that worked in libraries. Um, so, most of the time so far, you're in, you're in California. Mm -hmm. And then you're private first class, and you come back from your furlough, and then you go to Fort Lewis, Washington. And that's a, a an exit point, a departure point, Fort Lewis. Or well, Fort Lewis was a uh, uh, I don't remember what the initials were, so I hate to hesitate to use them. D O N E outfit, but they were regular army. D O T O N E. T O N E. Yeah, and that's where like you you, you still go through you go through. Uh, 
like what you your trainings you're doing basic training almost all over again except you're no longer training you're doing it like the real thing and in maneuvers we took maneuvers up in Alaska we went over to uh, uh, different places in the country like uh, Tacoma uh, I can't think of the name of the town right now it's uh, in Washington State and they made the movie to Helen back Audie Murphy we did that movie they used us as extras you know, we played German soldiers and... Well, you say they didn't hit American soldiers for a train. Yeah, yeah. Soldiers. well, it was the war was over with and they needed guys. You know, they got to, the, the studio, I guess, paid them to do that. So our outfit was selected to do that. And, um, Have and you ever seen the films? Yeah, oh yeah. And, but, uh, it turned out that our outfit was... They had another outfit that was going up there in maneuvers anyway. And we didn't go. So what they did do is they had a division parade right at the beginning of the movie. And at the end of the movie, and we normally, on payday, we would get paid and we'd get a weekend pass. Because Audie Murphy was in town doing this movie, they, were, they had a, a division parade, and they wanted to film it for the movie, and they did. It took about two hours to film it the way they wanted it. So, yeah, I remember it very well. So, um, Audie, Mur Audie Murphy, of course, was a... Uh, most decorated hero of World War II. He was, that, was he from Texas or something? Yeah, he was a little farm boy from Texas. And he was a good looking little kid. I mean, he, that's what he looked like, a little boy. He was a real boy looking guy and a little little guy. But he was, you know, he was a hero, war hero. So he ended up making cowboy pictures. Yeah. So he, he fought against the Germans then. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Oh yeah, he sure did. I mean, they're like a little bit hell. So at this time, are you uh, assigned to the 2nd Infantry Division? No, I was assigned to the 44th Infantry Division. That was the, the 2nd Infantry Division was in Korea. And about, see I got out in November of 54, they sent the 2nd uh, Division back from Korea. They deactivated them in Korea and sent them back to the United States to this country, send to Fort Lewis, Washington. That's the outfit I was in when I got out. I was in 44th Division. And they deactivated it and made it a second division. And I remember that so well because I had to change all my patches and I had like less than a month to go. And all my uniforms I had changed. Did you have to change the patches yourself? Mm -hmm. you know, well, I didn't have to, but I was... So you cut them off and then sew them back on or whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you don't do that, you got to pay somebody to do yeah. it. You know, I, by that time I was a corporal, and I, you know, was making big money, I mean, yeah. two hundred twenty-five dollars so, a month. Um, when you're in basic training, uh, or when, you, when when are you assigned to a, an army uh, unit? When you're in basic training. When you're in basic training. So yeah. You, so you were assigned to the forty-fourth when you were. In no, training. no, no, no. I was assigned. I was in seventh armored division. Seventh armored uh, division. Seventh armored division. That was for that was Camp Roberts, California. Camp Roberts. That was the whole the whole ca campus. The seventh armored division. And then you were. Uh, then I went to uh, Fort Lewis to the 44th Division. 44th. Right, and then they brought the second division back, and they deactivated the 44th, and I was in the second division. And then I got out. And then you got out. Yeah. So, so it was at the end of the at that time when you got out, you had a choice of being in the active reserve or the inactive reserve. If you took the active reserve. You could cut down your reserve time for, I think it was a year. So you only had to serve five years instead of six. Well, I decided I didn't want to, I didn't want to be active. I didn't want any part of it. I just wanted to be out. But they used to send you letters once in a while and say, hey, all right. Yeah. Because I knew guys who got called back in for various things. I don't remember what they were anymore. But yeah. It scared me half to death. So you're, um, Period of obligation. I served two years active duty and six years inactive. So you were sick. So, uh, so your inact your inactive duty period ended in nineteen six uh, fifty. Wait a minute. No, no, nineteen fifty four. Six years. Yes, nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixty. Yeah. And then I had to write them to send me a discharge. Yeah, and then they finally got around to doing it, and I got discharged in 1961 or 62. I forgot what it was anymore. So um, from Fort Lewis, then, 
Were you around these maneuvers? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was still like, stationed at Fort Lewis. Yeah. That was still my permanent station, but I was spent two months in Alaska. So, yeah, tell us about Alaska. Well, that was, we, they sent us there on maneuvers. We uh, went by ship from uh, Seattle up to uh, a place called, uh, uh, my mind is, I can't remember the name of the port, Whittier, Whittier, Alaska. And then we got aboard uh, trains and they took us to uh, uh, Anchorage and we were there for three days. And uh, then we went from there, we went up to uh, uh, Fairbanks. But that was all by either truck or walking. And when we got up to Fairbanks, there was a little camp. Now, uh, there was a military installation, but we were supposed to attack them and take over. The aggressor forces had that post, and they were the enemy, and we were supposed to go and take them. Well, they annihilated us. Oh, wiped us out. Completely wiped us out. How do you, uh, how do, how do they annihilate you without, well, you know, a paintball or something? Or? Well, just about. It's not quite that, you know, that's probably what they do today. They had us, uh, we were supposed to go down this gully and then go up the other side and then take over the uh, installation. We got down in the gully and they dropped tear gas on us. And anybody who came up with a tear in his eye was dead. Well. So why didn't, um, had you known that they might hit you with tear gas? No, 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 we never, you know. We never. That wasn't fair, was it? That was poor intelligence? Well, no, we don't know. I mean, you know, the thing was we got hit. Well, all we know is we got, we got our butts whipped. Because they used tear gas? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a legal weapon in those days? I don't know. Whatever they want to do is, is well, whatever they, they do. We they react like uh, if it were real combat. Yeah. And, you know, just, so did you eventually dislodge this force? Or? No. Oh. No. no. I, I, <laughs> we were dead. We were gone. So they sent us back to the states. That was all. Uh, we just you know I mean I look back on it, I think what a waste of time and money. But it was like they had nothing better to force. Yeah, I suppose the I suppose Korea. Uh, the ceasefire in '53, then. Yeah. So the army has to sort of slowly yeah. retract or get small contract. Well, go back to peacetime. Yeah. And then still be worried in case something might happen. And then you've got all these huge yeah. numbers of. Well, you know, if you think about it, we have not been to war, a real, honest to God war since World War II. Mm -hmm. Korea was not a war. It was a police action. Uh, Vietnam was not a war. We're not at war now. It's not just because the president says we're at war. It's just not done that way. It has to be declared a war by the powers that be, and they're not declaring wars. It costs too much money, and who are we fighting anyway right now? And we don't have an enemy. We don't have anybody who walks around with uniform on. Even in Vietnam, we knew who the enemy was, and they had uniforms. Now, I mean, we're just fighting people, and how do you, how do you kill a civilian? They're all civilians. You know, the kids are soldiers, everybody. You know, it's a very confusing thing. At least in our time, we knew what we were fighting against. But we were not really at war, in the, in the strict sense of the, of the word. It was not a declared war. That um, pseudo-tear gas, did it make you sick or anything? Oh, no. It was no. made it do it. Just this pepper with yeah. sting in your eye or whatever. It, it smells that. terrible. It comes oh. off the smell. And it makes you, you know. And they don't, but they, they didn't use it real heavily. I mean, just enough to know that it was there. Yeah. And when you're carrying 60 pounds or 80 pounds on your back and you go on the side of a hill and you got a weapon and the whole thing, and then all of a sudden there you are. You're willing to give up anyway. You know, you know it's a game. And, but that's, that's the... Well, if, if you had gained the, the camp or the fortification, would you have been rewarded or... Uh, well, yeah, in the sense that you, it would have been on your uh, your record that you did something that was good. But I mean, as far as there's no extra rations or anything like that. How, how many how many troops they tried to? Or was it just for your outfit? You think that they staged? Well, them? no, it was. Uh, we were going after a, a couple hundred guys, and we were a couple hundred guys. Uh, I don't know how they decide who to send and who not to yeah. send. It was like, uh, I was also, I went to leadership school and I had less than a month to go to get out. And they had a leadership school and they had to fill the uh, school 
uh, they had, I, I think it was like 30 guys a month. And they take them from different outfits. And they take like two from this outfit and two, to fill their ranks. And uh, we were going to maneuvers, my outfit was going to maneuvers in San Diego. Well, San Diego, if you've ever been there, it's like, that's like Hawaii. I mean, the nicest. Uh, it must be a lovely place. Oh, it's a beautiful place. It's great the weather. Yeah. Climate is the best in the world next to Hawaii. And uh, I was looking forward to it. I thought it was a waste of time because I was getting out and I would have been discharged the same time I was in San Diego. So I thought, oh, this is silly. He said, well, we got another job for you. We're going to send you to leadership school. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? I'll get out. It's leadership school. I have, I'll get through with that, and I'll have a week to go, and I'll get out. He said, we got to send somebody. And it was supposed to be a voluntary thing. This is the Army. We need three volunteers, you and you. And that's the way it is. So he said, you're volunteering. And I said, I don't want to go to leadership school. And I said, well, that or if you go to San Diego, you're not going to like it. And believe me, you're not going to like it. So I took them at their word, so I went to leadership school. So you never got to go to San Diego? No, no. not then. <laughs> but uh, no, they, my whole outfit went. So I got out of uh, leadership school and I went back to my outfit and the whole place was empty. Because they still had a week to go before they were done. Yeah. And, and the leadership school was took place in? In Fort Lewis. In Fort Lewis. Yeah. yeah. And their whole idea was mostly classroom stuff. That you had to learn how to be a good leader of men. Well, whatever they taught me, I already knew. I had already learned all that stuff in different aspects from different people. Although it wasn't this way, I got a certificate. It says I graduated from leadership school. That's one of the pictures I'll be bringing in from my class from leadership school. Yeah, that would be nice to scan it. Yeah, add that to the record. So then you're, um, what did they say, mustered out, or where you're discharged from? Uh, from Fort Lewis. From Fort Lewis. And you make your way back by a plane? Or well, they give you uh, mustering out pay, and they, you know, give you, uh, uh, they don't, they, you go home the way you want to go home. But so did you, you make a beeline for Chicago, or? I sure did. Went right over to SeaTac Airport and took off the next day, and two of the others in Chicago. And it was nice to be home. Your family was glad to see you. And well, they didn't, you know, of course. You You're know. back, yeah, sure. But you know, it's. But you didn't have any trouble making any adjustment to civilian life or anything here. No, not really. Not really. I suppose you know, had I been in combat, when I say I met people in the service that I, I remember one kid in particular. He was a farm boy from North Dakota. And when I met him, he was 18 years old. He had just gotten back from Korea. He was a sergeant. And uh, he made the sergeant right before they froze the rank. This guy wasn't old enough to vote. He was not old enough to have a drink legally. But he had just served a year and a half on the front lines of Korea. He was a combat veteran. He was as high a rank as he'd probably ever get in the military. And yet he, he was like a, a big old kid, but he was a, a world a war veteran, you know, I mean, a, a battle weary guy. And I thought, my God, I'm two years older than him, and I haven't seen half of what this kid's seen. Different. Yeah. I wonder how his life turned out here. I'm sure he went back to the farm. Yeah. But I saw the same guy do something that I never, I mean, I was, yeah. I guess it's like went on the farm. Somebody got hurt, and uh, we were on maneuvers, and they pulled their arm out of the socket. Well, I can imagine how much it hurt. I mean, the guy was just screaming, uh, and his arm was like this, and he couldn't straighten it out. And this guy came over, and whatever he did, he grabbed it, and he just yanked his arm, put it right back in his pocket. And I just stood there in amazement. This guy's a teenager. He's doing stuff like that. He knew what to do. Yeah. I wouldn't have known what to do. I, I'm sorry. I wish there was something I could do to ease your pain, but I don't know what to do. Yeah. And this guy had the, you know, the smarts to do something. But, oh my God. So, as when you, um, after you released her from the army, then or active duty, did you um, keep up with any of the friends you made in the army? Or no, which really surprised me because I met a lot of guys. 
a lot of people that you think you're going to keep in touch with. You know, you think this is going to be my best friend forever. We look all we've been through, blah blah blah. They're just acquaintances. Yeah. People you know. And I ran into a couple of guys quite by accident. I was working downtown at the time. I worked at the First National Bank, and I, one guy was a messenger. He used to come to the bank all the time, and he was one of my guys when I was when I was a cadreman. He had been drafted in the army, and he was like 35 years old. He married and had two kids, and for whatever reason, he never got drafted. And they drafted him in the army, and he came over to me, and I was taking. This is when I was taking the guys out, you know, out to the field. And I was like 21, 20. I was, and I was in good shape. And this guy was in good shape for a 35-year-old man, but he was still 35, and he wasn't in the best shape. He came over and he said, Bob, he said, I'm not asking for any special food, but I can't keep up with these kids. And he, you know, told me what happened. He says, if you can see your way clear to help me out, he said, I'd really appreciate it. I said, oh, what the heck, man? I, he came, you know, like a man, and you know, asked me. So I saw that he got the easier jobs, you know, whatever I could do to help the guy out. Well, I, he was the guy that I ran into all the time. And he, he praised me that day. Oh, that was good. He said, you know, you, I don't know that I could have done it without you. I'm like, well, I'm glad I could have. was there to help. I was also, during the time I was in the Army, this is when they integrated the Army. Fascinating, yeah. And uh, that was, I mean, we didn't even realize it was being done. And when we went to Fort Lewis, we went, that was the days, the old barracks where they had the, wooden barracks and there was like uh, four squads to a barracks. They had two on the first floor, two on the second floor. And uh, about most of the guys were from the Midwest in our basic training out there, most from Chicago, a lot from Chicago. And uh, they wanted to integrate these, everybody, but they wanted to do it softly without making a big deal out of it. So they just told everybody, just go find a buck. So what you ended up with, two black barracks, two white barracks. They said, this isn't going to work. This isn't what it's supposed to do. So they put everybody alphabetically, which pretty much worked out pretty good. But a lot of guys got their nose above, you know, like, oh, I have to be next to a black guy. What is that? You know, and I never met a black person in my life before I went to the Army. I'm from Chicago. Now, when I say I never met him, I just never lived in, you know, that was... They had black neighbors, they had Jewish neighbors, they had Irish neighbors, they had Polish neighbors, and so on and so forth, back in those days. And it just wasn't, you know, you never thought much about it. And I, I knew, you know, I'd seen black people, and I met a couple, but, you know, I never had any problems with anybody. So we had one guy from the west side of Chicago, and he said, what do you think of that? You know, we got in, in the museum work. Yeah. yeah. He had a guy, they had double bumps in those days. He was on the bottom, and the guy above him, was a black guy, and he was from the South, and he was the nicest guy he ever met. And by the time basic training was over, these guys were like brothers. Never had any, never had any racial problems in this whole, in any of the barracks. Everybody was fine. Everybody got you know, along fine. So I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, the common, sort of common sense and decency uh, prevailed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And guys would help one another, and I mean, there was never a thing about black or white or red or yellow. We had Spanish, we had Orientals, we had American Indians. That was another thing, too. We had a couple of Indians, and they weren't Native Americans. I had an Indian kid tell me one day, he said, we can't be Native Americans. There were no Americans when we were first here. They were just us, we were Indians. That's good. Yeah, never had a problem. Yeah. And that part I enjoyed. I, 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 I met a lot of people in the service. I remember uh, some of the vets say the, that same thing about the, because um, you meet different people from all parts of the sure. country and it's a great mixing that goes on. And oh, yeah. Uh, as you were saying about Gizmo, you, you wind up talking and being with people you would never imagine otherwise. Yeah. And then and then some some folks are really good in certain situations that you might think, uh, like your farm. Oh, he you know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And he was just was back, laid back about it, like it was an everyday thing to him. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> thank God he was there. So when you, um, so you, you didn't, um, it was hard to keep up these, in the way of life, you just don't maintain some of these uh, acquaintances, as you put it, 
of well, the Army, although you run into some of them later. Well, I did, but I mean, you know, <laughs> you're young and yeah, and you meet, you know, you go from one station to the next. Like the guys went to Korea, I stayed in the states, you know. So I met a whole bunch of new guys, and I, I, one philosopher I've always had all my life is the word friendship. I I believe in my heart of hearts that if you meet five people in your life that you can consider friend, you've met a lot. Because, I mean, these same guys, they were my friends at the time. They were acquaintances. They weren't my friends. I mean, they might have been. It had circumstances and different. But they were acquaintances. And you made acquaintances all your life. And some of them you keep. Like, real, I'm just talking about real close friends. And I think that's an admirable thing to have, but it doesn't happen very often. But acquaintances, yeah, you meet people all the time. And it, that's part of the adventure of life. Is to meet people and you know to and share their life and uh, learn from them. Did you um, did you regret not being sent to Korea? I did at the time because I thought that's expected of me. That's supposed to be what I'm well, that was what I'm supposed to be doing. That's what I was trained to do. And you know there's guys over there that got sent over that maybe should have gone. Maybe, you know I just thought. I was patriotic enough to believe that that was what my lot in life was yeah. supposed to be. Pardon me, the, you did the basic training at at uh, Fort Camp Roberts. Yeah, that was in California. In armored. Did well, they, they call it, it. It was just an outfit. I mean, that was the division that was did, there. Did that content? Did the content of that basic training differ from the next basic training you experienced? Uh, yeah, but it had nothing to do with armor. Nothing to do with it armor. was an infantry training. infantry training. They had heavy weapons infantry, they had light weapons infantry. In every other cycle, like I went through light weapons infantry, that was my MOS. The cycle after that was heavy weapons, and that was one I taught in. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, some of it I knew. But, but you taught in uh, ammo, light infantry, did you yeah. say? Yeah. And I'm sorry, MOS refers MOS to? MOS is your job description. I don't remember what the M and O S yeah. mean anymore. But that's what your job description is. And you said your MOS is 1745. That means your heavy weapons infantry training. That's what you went through. I mean, know what you're going to do. Uh, so when I, I went now, Camp Roberts was in the middle of the Mojave Desert. So I had desert training, and I ended up in Alaska. Military. I mean, this is this is army logic. Uh, I had a friend of mine I had met after I got out, who was in army. He was a clerk typist in the army personnel division at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. And these guys would come in to be assigned to basic training, and they say, "What'd you do in civilian life?" So he type up that. And he remembers so well that one guy came in. He was a fireman. And they made him a truck driver. And the guy right behind him was a truck driver. They made him a fireman. And I thought, well, that's typical military logic. That's very good. Yeah. So when you um, you're released from the army in Fort Lewis, yeah. you make your way home in the truck. Did you had some money saved or a paycheck? No, 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 no. They give you uh, uh, they give you a. Uh, I forgot how it goes, what they call it. Uh, I was drafted in Chicago. That is where I get paid. When I got out, I got paid from, I got a check to buy a ticket to Chicago. Now I can use it any way I want. I sure yeah. won't. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, they, uh, they have to pay me or drop me off in Chicago. They have to get me back to Chicago in order to get out. That's where I, I got in. That's where they took me in. That's where I got out. So and they're paying you all the time that you're in the Army. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I was just wondering if you treated yourself to a new car or something when you got home. Or, uh... That's another thing. I haven't driven a car since 1955. Wow. I never liked to drive, and I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. So I didn't. But, uh, yeah. So did your military uh, experience help you in the job world? Uh, yeah, I think it did. I think it did. I think I got, uh, I took that with me as far as the work ethic, which has always been very good, but I, uh, yeah. And um, if, as you look back, what, 
what impact or influence do you think the military experience had on your life? Prompt. I'm overly prompt, and I'm very. Uh, I have little patience with people in art. If I if I say I'll be at a certain place at a certain time, I will be there. There'll be no doubt. I will not be early. Won't be. I mean, I'll be early rather than late. And I have kids. My my. I got three boys that are nothing like that at all. And my youngest one, the one who drove me here, he he gets me here on time because he gets tired of hearing me bitch about it. But it just drives me crazy. I have, and it's something that I've, I've been with since the service. I, I have no patience with people that are late. If you have a, you know, I, if you have a job, and not being the driver, I've worked at different locations. I used to work for Jewel. I was a manager for Jewel. I worked all over the city. I lived on the north side. I had to be at a certain place at a certain time. I made sure that I was there. It was not their problem to see that I got there. It was my problem to see that I got there. And if I had to leave a half hour early, then I left a half hour early. But it's I was never I was never late. And I have no I, I, I have no patience with anybody that's late. I just don't understand how you can be late. You take that into consideration and I learned that in a service. That's the way it is. <laughs> So you think, uh, is there anything you'd like to add to the interview at this time? Or, uh, well, I don't, can't think of anything right off the top of my head. I, I do think, I, and I, I, I pull the politics, really should never enter into something like this, but I have, I think the worst thing Richard Nixon ever did was stop the draft. I really believe that. You know, I was going to bring up the question of whether or not uh, national military service you think was a good idea, or national wow. service, because we often wind up talking about that in these interviews. Well, I, I can't speak for anybody on one go by me, and I told this to my kids a hundred times. And without exception, my kids never had to worry about the draft, my three sons. And they said, well, Dad, you know, I'm glad they don't have it. I said, well, I can understand why you are glad they don't have it. But by the same token, we wouldn't be running into the problems we're running into today if we had a draft. We wouldn't have to worry about where we're getting the government, where are these guys, where are these soldiers coming from that we're so quick to send overseas to some unknown place. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, it was just, I took it as part of my life. I knew when I was a kid that. Maybe. I mean, it didn't happen to everybody. A lot of people that didn't go in the service for various reasons. I have a twin brother. I had a twin brother. He did not. He and I got drafted at the same time. My brother had gone out and gotten a little, had a little problem with the law. And he and a couple other guys took a car. If they thought it was abandoned, it turned out it was not abandoned. So they went up in a stolen car. He was put on uh, probation for a year. It wasn't no big deal. And when the year was up, he was supposed to be expunged. Well, it wasn't expunged. But during that year is when I got drafted in the Army. Well, because he was on, you know, because he had his problem, they didn't take him. Didn't mean he was off the hook, I just meant. So when all this other stuff was done, they took him. So he decided he wanted to go in and he was going to get what he wanted out of the army rather than have them draft him. So he joined. And I told him he was a fool. And he said, no, no. He said, I'm going to get what I want. He said, I want to be a truck driver in the army. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to volunteer to be a truck driver. He said, well, good, good for you. If they have had a truck driving job available when you sign up, you'll probably get it. But if they don't, you won't. And they'll tell you, hey, babe, we'll give you whatever you want. And I was right. He was wrong. But having said that, I don't know what uh, made me go off on that tangent. But the army, uh, no, I, I really believe that in my heart of hearts. I think I had, I had, we always had the draft. It was, so was, it, was the draft a good experience for your brother? Do you think that? Or? No, he had a he, bad attitude. Yeah. I mean, he did it, and it was okay. You know, but he didn't get what he wanted. Yeah. Um, Mr. Morris, perhaps we could discuss this. You mentioned that your son drove you today, yeah. and that you have um, um, a walking stick. Yeah. And you referenced um, uh, emphysema. 
uh, how do you how how would you care to comment on um, the VA and what it if it, if it helps you these in your present situation or? Well, it does because I get my medication, I get all my meds from the VA, and uh, it, I had for a while when I was first diagnosed with uh, uh, Parkinson's. Uh, there was one medication that I couldn't get from them. That medication cost more than all my other meds put together. I had to get it from like Walgreens or someplace. Finally, I went to the VA and I gave my tail a whoa, and they had one of the doctors there put together two medications to make the one medication. So now I'm taking two pills instead of one, and it's costing me one third of what it would have cost me. But I, yeah, I uh, I have nothing but the utmost regard for the VA, and that's me. It worked for me, and I I'm not saying I, I take advantage of it, but I'm getting something that's offered to me, and I haven't had any problem at all getting these medications, and uh, you know I go to them and I ask them for what I need, and they give it to me right there. So I'm very happy with the VA, and I had talked to different people and suggested they do the same thing, and they don't. Well, I can't force anybody to do it, but I know at least three people who were eligible to get the same things and never did it. And it doesn't matter anymore because they're not around. Yes, absolutely. So at this point then, unless there's something you'd like to add, maybe we'll think about okay. including the interview. If there's something you think of later that you want to add, I'll write it down. Um, I've had some vets where they, um, they've they even taken the tape home and played it for their family and then somebody says, Dad, but you didn't include your, that one story. Well, <laughs> so we come back and do a postscript. I can do that. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. But uh, I think you've had a few anecdotes that are uh, illustrative <laughs> of, the, uh, of the Army and we appreciate well, I that. I think the uh, anecdotes. I think everybody that's been in the Army has probably got a million of them. Yeah. And you think about them and you think about some of the people you met. Yeah. Uh, I, I've always had a good sense of humor, and I always liked people that did, and I, and I think that came out more than anything. Yeah. Some of the guys, like I talked about, one of, the, one of the guys, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Indians have a, American Indians have a bad reputation of being mean when they drink. Yes. Well, I saw the exception. We called him Chief. What would you call an Indian? Chief. He thought it was funny. It didn't bother him any. So we, that was his nickname all through the service. And the first time he ever went into town, he got drunk, and he came back, and he fell asleep, and we had to get him up the next day to go out and, you know, go to work, you know, for want of a better word. Had to go out and stand right rivoli, and he wasn't in any shape to do it. But he wasn't me. He was smiling having a good old time. Took about three hours to wear off before he could finally work. We covered for him. Yeah. But he well, on that pleasant note, uh, yeah. Mr. Morris, I think we'll uh, turn off the tape recorder, and I thank you for coming in and well, sharing your Well, thank you very uh, much, my pleasure. Uh, experience. Thank you. I will get those pictures to you when I can. We're going to keep this right. Uh, we're continuing uh, with our Veterans History Project interview uh, of Mr. Morris, which we uh, conducted last August, the 8th of August, in this year, 2007. And now we're uh, meeting again today uh, to add uh, an interesting an anecdote um, to Mr. Uh, Morris's interview. And uh, <laughs> okay, and I'll go from there. Uh, I, would, I, I left out a few things I believe the last time we talked, and uh, I wanted to mention about uh, when I did go overseas, how uh, how I got there. Uh, I think I mentioned that we left out of Seattle uh, and took a ship over there to Whittier, Alaska. Uh, with the name of the ship, by the way, was US, USS Thomas of Jefferson. On the way over there, we ran into a uh, hurricane, too, which was, yeah. That's far north, yeah. Yeah, and it was that time of year, and we ran into some real bad weather while we were over there also, but uh, we ran into a hurricane, and I was walking from the back of the ship to the front of the ship, which is from the aft to the fore, I believe that's what they call it. 
And I was by myself, and I had to go across the top of the, the ship in order to get there, and I was on the outside of the ship, and I got hit in the face with a wave, and it was like somebody smacked me over the hand as hard as they could. And the first reaction is to fight back, and there's nobody to fight because Mother Nature. Anyway, so uh, when I first got aboard the ship, I was put on KP, and we were pulling out of uh, uh, Seattle Harbor, and I got sicker than a dog, and I got oh, yeah. seasick. Uh, and I didn't eat for three days going overseas, well, because I could. And then finally, the last day, I was feeling better, and I went up and I was going through the chow line, and I had my tray there, and then Navy eats good. They eat real good. They had Swiss steak, and they had well, mashed potatoes and gravy, and lima beans on the side. And they give you dessert. It was a shortcake with strawberries on it. I served that strawberries with all that syrup and right back to where I was before. And there went my meal and me and everything else. Anyway, so <coughs> we got over to Alaska and our, our coming back from uh, after we'd gone through our maneuvers and got killed, got destroyed. Uh, we were in this tent city, which is part of Fort Richardson, and uh, we uh, uh, were waiting orders to, become, to come back. Uh, and uh, we had a, uh, an outfit right next to us in this tent city, and they were waiting the same thing we were. But they had a, they had a uh, uh, mascot that uh, took a liking to us, because he, he was a husky dog. Which are, you know, cold weather dogs. This dog decided he liked to come in over a tent and it was warm. So we took a liking to him. You know, you think a bunch of guys, and 99% of men are dog nuts anyway. So we decided he was our dog. He, he, did, he uh, decided he wanted to be with us, so we made sure we got him back to the States. What we did, everything was in alphabetical order, so me and a guy named Mears. And another guy with the letter M in his initials. Uh, we had taken our rucksacks, which are great big backpacks, and uh, we took one of the guys, and one who was in the middle. I think his name was Mears. He was his father was uh, Rick Mears, the race car driver. Later years. Anyway, he uh, uh, we took all his personal belongings, put up between us, and we put the dog in there. So we walk up the gangplank. As long as he kept moving, the dog was fine. If he stopped, the dog would start whining and moving around. Well, we got back up on the uh, uh, walking up the gangplank, and the dog started acting up. And said, oh, there we go. We're going to get caught. We're going to get in trouble. We'll probably get court martial. The dog will be thrown overboard. It'll be the end of that. Well, to make, we did get the dog aboard, and. Uh, it became known all over the ship that we had the dog, except by the sailors. We couldn't let the Navy know about it because we were afraid of you know, what they would do. And uh, so we'd take it for walks. And, and everybody brought back a little piece of leftovers from their dinner, their chow, so the dog had plenty to eat. And of course, the problem was getting rid of the waste. Well, we figured that one out, so we just threw it overboard. And uh, we got. We found out that our company executive officer, who was the second command, ex commanding officer, he found out about it, and he came and threatened us that if we didn't get that dog back, we were running a court martial. But the company commander didn't know about it, it would be a surprise for him. Well, we did. And a company commander, he took over the dog from that time. It was his dog. <laughs> so we built a dog house for him and took him to the uh, to the uh, the uh, uh, sick hall, the um, what do they call it? Uh, anyway, we took them in and they, they, the doctors and looked at them and they weren't vets, but they you know they gave them many shots. And, anyway, the dog was well taken care of, cleaned them up, scrubbed them down, and like I say, we had a dog house for him. And then the cooks always made sure he had plenty to eat. He was really getting to be a spoiled dog. Now a husky gets to be pretty good size, and he grew fast. We had him for about two weeks, and then he disappeared. And the only thing we could figure is that he had no real master. You know, he wasn't. He just everybody was his boss. You know, 
And you go out every morning, we go out for physical training, you know, go out through March and, and do a double time for a half a mile or something. He was always right next to the company commander. And then she all should hit the fan when we lost the dogs, but somebody stole them. And we, somebody, we had found his leash was cut. And we just figured he took off, and we just never saw him again. We just figured somebody, you know, liked him better than we did. And uh, so that was the, and we named him Boondocks. We found him in the Boondocks, and that's what we named him. And he was a beautiful dog. He was all black with white paws and a white spot on his face. He was gorgeous, friendly. And then uh, the one thing I remember about the service was always being hungry. We were always hungry. There was never enough food. The one that was enough food, we were just you know, used to civilian life and being able to leave what you want. Once a month, this was when we were up at Fort Lewis in Washington, smorgasbords were a big deal back in those days. So about six of us every month, uh, we cut them short. Every month we would get together and we'd go in to the smorgasbord. And we'd sit there and just eat ourselves to death. And all the beer we wanted to drink, and it was, this was a monthly thing until I got out of the, out of the military. And then there was another guy, a buddy of mine and I, he was from Southern Illinois, his name was Reynolds, John Reynolds. And he and I, a couple of times a month, we'd go into Seattle. And he introduced me to a thing I never thought of before. When you're in the service, you know, you always, there's always a, 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 a GI street, like in Chicago, it used to be South State Street, where all the strip joints are, and the tattoo parlors, and the B-movie houses, and looking for the the prostitutes and stuff, that's just the military way of life. He said, that's not the way to do it. He said, the best way to do it is go downtown to the big places. He said, it costs a couple of bucks more, but people treat you nice. And they did. So we'd go downtown, and we'd walk into a barn and sit down, and pretty soon everybody's buying his drinks, and they're talking nice, because they figured we were a class here, and the guy's hanging around down the South State Street, even though we done not many of those. And then there was the... Uh, uh, that was in, oh God, I had my memories go. Uh, the, uh, I don't know, I don't know what that would go because I can't, I can't remember, but I lost my train of thought. And uh, I guess that's, oh, what I mentioned that I had been training in the Mojave Desert. And I'm not sure if I mentioned that in my first, uh, first interview we had. I thought it was ironic. This is typical military logic. I trained in the Mojave Desert, so and I had to go to Alaska. Makes that's military logic. Military logic. And uh, also, my son wanted me to mention about my medals. Yes, yes, that's important. Well, you know, when you're in the service, you know, and in this, like I never went overseas except Alaska. It was considered overseas duty, even though. It was be and it was also before statehood. It was only a territory. Mm -hmm. and it, but even today, it's considered overseas duty. Anyway, uh, one day we were out of maneuvers, and I came or out doing something. I don't know, playing some army game. And I came in in the middle, you know, the end of the day. And on my bunk, there was a uh, set of orders cut for a good conduct medal. Well, it's a medal. It's not a, 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 just a, a ribbon you put on your. Jack, it's, it's a real honest to God medal, and you had to meet certain qualifications in order to get it. And I was really shocked that I even got it. I mean, not that I was a bad guy or anything, or I was getting in trouble, but it just never occurred to me that somebody would put me in for it. And it kept changing the rules of how you went and got it. You had to be in like a certain amount of time while well, I was only in two years. And I got it in about, 12 uh, about 16 months. And I thought, well, that's awful strange. But then I guess they changed the rules, but I got it. And uh, then I got the National Defense Service Medal, which is a little ribbon that they give out. It's, everybody gets it. No matter what branch of service you're in, everybody gets it. Well, that was started when I was in. We got the, the first National Defense Service Medal. And uh, since then, I have, got, I have acquired a, uh, a catalog of, uh, that shows you what ribbons and medals belong together, and I guess you probably have it here in the library, probably a copy of some kind of a book that would show you that, give you that information. 
Well, since I've been out, and it's 50 years, you know, a lot of people don't live 50 years. In the 50 years since I've been out, they've had three new medals that I'm authorized to wear that I didn't even know I had. And there's a couple from World War II that also people that are World War II veterans can wear. And probably, you know, they weren't even, they were they died years ago. I mean, they we're losing, like you said, I think you told us a thousand a day. That's, that's a low, low estimate. Yeah, why would they come out with medals or ribbons that some guy can wear when it's so many years ago, 60 years ago, my God. Yeah. But I just thought it was strange, you know, here I can, I got two more medals. I can walk around with like a Christmas tree and I never even did anything. All I did was serve two years in the service. Well, you trained people and you were willing to go. Well, yeah, well, I'm well, willing to go. I mean, if I had my option, I probably would have said no. And then, then, you know, I wasn't asked. It was just, you know, just, you took it and what it was worth. I enjoyed it. I'm sorry I did it, you know, go back and think about it all over the years. It's kind of fun. But well, not at the time. Yeah. I think your family uh, is possessed of the same good judgment as you are in, in uh, encouraging you to come back in and add those anecdotes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they did. That, they, that's yeah. good. They did. Especially yeah. my son. You know, he yeah. said, Dad, I'm proud of you. I want you to go out and tell everybody. I said, well, it's a little late to be doing that. And he said, no, no, no. I think you should do it. Yeah. Uh, that's it. So in that case, son knows best. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you.